Hey everybody, happy to be here today. We're gonna give it a few minutes for people to join. Go ahead while we wait for other people to join us. My name is Jenny Tilton Flood. I'm going to be going, I'm going to start our chat in just a few seconds. But if you're joining us for this session, please put your, where you're, where you're viewing me from and, and any questions right in the chat. And I'll be able to, to see that and, and maybe we can have a conversation about where y'all are from. Welcome everybody. So glad to have you all with us. I'm gonna give it just a few more seconds to make sure everybody who wants to join can. I'm so excited to be here. I'm a little horrified. I am not used to being on this side of the camera at all. I'm trying to avoid looking at my own reflection. We need to work on that ladies and gentlemen, don't we? And everybody else, we all need to work on that. Confidence is key. So everybody, thank you so much for joining us and thank you Build Up Dietitians for giving me the opportunity to have a conversation with y'all. My name is Jenny Tilton Flood. I am a Maine dairy farmer. Um, I'm a work in progress and I am so proud of the work that we do in agriculture as dairy farmers and part of our food systems. And I really appreciate the opportunity to actually speak with you all and, and have a conversation about the things that are important that we maybe sometimes don't think about when it comes to agriculture and farming. Um, just this morning, I was watching one of my peers do an amazing job testifying in the first of what will be many hearings um, and opportunities to, to express and impress upon our policymakers the importance of the people within the system that are part of our farm bill. So uh, Ashley Messing Kennedy from Michigan spoke up today and she did an amazing job. And all the other folks that were there, including, I have to say, um, I think his name is Dr. Phil Knight. I'll double check that. Um, and he, he happened to say, um, hunger is not beyond us to solve. And he's from the uh, Food Bank Council of Michigan and I just think that that's an important thing and that's gonna be sort of a thread that goes through the rest of the conversation here today. Um, and I, I wanna continue to encourage you to tell me where you are and if you have any questions, let me know. So let me tell you a little bit about me and my farm. I grew up in a small town in, in Maine, right on the, the town line between Oakland and Sydney, Maine. Um, Oakland was the big town, Sydney was a small town. Um, and I ended up moving almost right down the road, a um, couple towns over to a dairy farm after a few things happened. Um, I grew up the, the first generation in my family that was not born on a farm, on both sides of my family. And for some odd reason, I did the, the dangest thing. I ended up back on one. And when I was growing up, my dad was the John Deere guy. Uh, my mom was the amazing woman who did everything. She made our clothes. She formed a business. She raised our food. She had a business raising food. I, I just, my family provided me with all these opportunities to learn and to be a part of family business, um, to learn that maybe that's not what I wanted to do with my life. <laughs> but then I found myself smack back dab in it. I spent most of my formative years wanting to leave my small town and go off to the farthest corners of the world. And when I left my small town to go to university for a couple of years, I swore I was going to leave and I was going to go feed corners of the world. 
And after a couple of years studying foreign policy, um, international relations, I realized what I wanted to do was feed my corner of the world. So I made it back to Maine and I started working for the family business, um, doing John Deere and parts and farm equipment with my dad. And as the parts girl behind the counter, I ended up delivering parts one day to the farm over here in Clinton and uh, never really kind of got away from it. The farmer's son and I have been together since 1993. We were raised at two kids. We're in the midst of that. They're 22 and 23. They are amazing and they are the light and the reason for everything because, um, you know, we, we talk a lot about the future. Um, we really have it in our hands when we're when we're talking about our kids. And I, I just want to put in a plug here for Gen Z. People can complain about them all they want, but I, I'm fiercely proud of them because they are doing amazing things and they are putting up with everything. We Gen Xers, millennials, and the silent generation and boomers have all left for them. So shout out to Gen Z. But fast forward to today. And our family farm sits right on the banks of the Kennebec River in Clinton, Maine, Maine's dairy capital, where we have more milk production in our town than any other town in the state of Maine. We produce per approximately from our five family farms about 15% of Maine's fluid milk production overall. And we're really proud of that. We're, we're proud of the fact that we have more cows than people in this town. And we're really proud of the fact that the cows that are here, as well as the people, all work together and are all striving to to make sure that there's a quality to life not just for us and not just for the animals but for the environment and land that we steward that's really important to us and and when i talk about stewarding the land i have to say that my husband's family has been here for you know almost 200 years they have they have they have been stewarding this land for two centuries the land they are stewarding and they call home was once home to the Wabanaki people. So when when we talk about the land we steward and the land we own, I, I really feel it's important to mention that the land that we derive our way of living from and we spend our lives on really was home to others. It's unceded land and another word for stolen. And I think it's important that we recognize when we, we work through our food system, we work through providing food, and we work on intentionally making sure that we're doing the right thing, that we remember that it is so easy for us to forget who we leave out and what we leave out. And that's why history is really important. It's very important to look at it critically and honestly so that our future is one that is a good one. So moving on, um, I... Our family farm has three generations actively farming here. We have, um, you know, there's seven families and households that are part of the families. Um, and from those, five of those seven households are solely dependent upon the farm for their income and, and, uh, and, and ability to, you know, put food on the table. Uh, we work with... 38 employees and co-workers and of that 38 seven of them are family members i'm not in that seven i am the eighth i'm the volunteer on the farm and our we have three generations that are actively engaged in daily operations on the farm and we take care of a few cows we take care of about 3200 cows ages just born today to 16 or 17 years old and about 1,660 of them get milked every single day. Um, and those cows produce almost 16,000 gallons of fresh quality milk each and every day. And that is bottled 75 miles down the road at the HP Hood plant in Portland, Maine. And if you're familiar with um, minor league ball, you will know that the Red Sox minor league Sea Dogs had a game last week. Um, and the Sea Dog Stadium is right next door to where our milk is bottled. And I mentioned that because it made the SI spotlight, uh, you know, highlights because of the bench clearing brawl. No affiliation with us. But anyway, so as we you know, we, we, we approach every day with how do we do things a little better than yesterday? How do we learn lessons from yesterday so that tomorrow's better? Um, and that applies not just to milking our cows, driving our tractors, 
um, and caring for the people that work here and live around here. But it's also in, in planning for how are we going to make sure that the milk that we're producing today is going to be what it needs to be. And, you know, we need it to come from a good place. We need it to be good quality and we need it to be a part of a sustainable, just system and food system. So a lot of thought goes into everything we do. Um, I, I will also say that um, our farm, like the other four family farms here in the town of Clinton, are all owners of the Cabot Creamy Cooperative. We're very proud of our B Corp certification with our co-op. We're very proud of the work that our co-op does to provide us with a network and the seven guiding principles of cooperatives that helps us be able to focus on what we do here and now on our farms so that we are able to, to be a part of a more just food system. Um, I'm gonna take a little look and see where people are coming from. I see uh, Jamie Jogger from Cambridge, Mass. Michelle, hi, from Indiana. Kim, nice to see you as well. Um, this is exciting for me and I'm still in horrified mode. So if you have any questions, please pop them in the chat. I will get to them. But I did wanna cover a couple of things that I thought um, a lot of people don't think about when they think about a dairy farm. You might not think about the fact that there are young people that are on these farms that are actively participating, not just in the, the labor and the work that goes on, but they're also participating in the decision making. And they're they're not just the focus of what what we're doing this for, but who we're doing it for. And they bring to us the idea that it's it's all about tomorrow. Um, and we spend a lot of time on our farms talking about the past. We really hate to change. Um, but when we have multi-generations here every single day, um, you know, one, we make sure that we put the fun and dysfunction as a family farm, but we also want to make sure that we're providing opportunities. As the mom of two kids that um, are actual adults now, uh, we spent a lot of time thinking about what we wanted to give our kids and why we were farming and why we continue to do it. Why did we make the difficult decisions to to not go to on a family vacation, um, were we shorting them in the long run? And for us and for so many family dairy farms, it isn't about making sure that the farm is there for them to operate and own when they reach a certain age. It's for them to be able to make a choice, um, to make sure that they have the opportunity to say, you know, I'd like to think about being in agriculture. I'd like to think about being a part of this farm. I want to think about the opportunity that this farm provides me, as well as think about the opportunities that lay on the outside of the farm. And that's something that a lot of a lot in agriculture, we don't we don't talk about enough. We don't think about enough. Um, we don't want to chain somebody to a farm. We don't want to push them off a farm. We need to make sure that we're always talking about what are the opportunities and how do we expand them? And that focus for me on our family farm um, with regards to our next generation has led us to raise one child who, who didn't wanna go anywhere but here, and that's great. Our son um, owns a home around the corner, a small farm of his own. Um, that is where we, we have a lot of crops that we, we harvest from his fields and he works full time and he is integral to all we do. And I also have a daughter who is a second year vet student, humble brag at Cornell, um, who went to a land grant university here in, in the great state of Maine and was a D1 athlete. And she knows that, that this has always been an opportunity and option for her and she's choosing a different path. And I'm so proud of her for doing that. But she wants to be involved in dairy farming and bovine practitioner. And, a, and, and that's the thing. It's like we, we've, we've been able to give them opportunities to make choices. Sometimes they come back like their mom came back to Maine. Sometimes they find a different path elsewhere. And that's important. And I think that sometimes we, when we look at dairy farmers and we look at agriculture, if we're outside of that field, we might think that, born into the life, you stay into the life. And I think it's important for people to understand that we do have different goals and different, and every generation wants to do a little bit different. So that's, 
that's really important to me. And it's also something I look at when I look at other people in other parts of, of our community. Um, just because, and, and we see it replicated. I, you know, we grew up around mill towns here and, and you, you know, you had a lot of people didn't have choices. You grew up, you went and worked in the same place where your old man worked, or you ended up taking the same jobs your mom had. And, and there's nothing wrong with carrying on those values and those traditions as long as they have a choice. And for a lot of people in our world right now, there are people who just don't have the opportunity to have choices. And sometimes that's because of circumstances and situations and black swan events that we are all very familiar with right now. But sometimes it has to do with the way we have structured things and the way we build up barriers and fences and ceilings and we don't do anything to dismantle them. And um, I think that it's important as someone who, who works so hard to put food on the table that we bring up these barriers and the injustices and the lack of diversity and equity and inclusion in everything from where the food comes from to how the food gets to where it's going and who is able to be at the table where it ends up. These are all really complicated issues. And, and at the end of the day, there may not be enough hours in the day to discuss it, but if a farmer doesn't talk about it and, and a dietitian doesn't talk about it, then who's left to talk about it in the food system? And so I would welcome any thoughts or questions about this as well. Um, and yes, Kim, hi from Hill, Illinois and uh, hello, Susan from Ohio. Um, and I am rambling a little bit now, but I see there's a question from Jamie Junker, Dr. Junker, regarding what is a B Corp? And I think that's a really great question because when we're talking about equity and diversity and, and being, being socially just, B Corp certification provides that sort of confirmation. It's a lot of work. Um, and after after all this, I'll include some links about B Corp certification um, and the work that goes into it. But basically, it's taking a, a, a business and saying, we want you to be the change and we want you to do it for good. Um, so making sure that our, our communities and our environment are all treated in sustainable manners. Um, and as uh, the world's first dairy cooperative that was certified as a B Corp, Cabot Creamy Cooperative is extremely proud as our farmer owners like me um, for that leading edge. And we're really proud to welcome um, the, the dairy cooperatives that have joined us over the past few years. Um, we're happy to have them along. We have some really amazing partners in the B Corp world, everything from um, Allagash, Allagash Beer here in Maine to um, also King Arthur Baking. Those are some of our favorite partners to work with. Um, and we, we look at B Corp certification as sort of proof in the pudding and making sure that the pudding's good and the proof is good. Um, how are you treating your workers? How are you driving your business? What are your priorities? And you have to quantify it. And they are always looking to make sure that that quantification and those qualifications are solid and they adjust and they move as our, as our needs and our demands get greater, then we're going to make sure we meet those standards. So that's a really great question. I really appreciate that. Um, and and um, I do notice that um, Lee has posted in the, the chat that they're um, in the mountains of West Western North Carolina, where she's from, there's a large dairy farm, um, from, not from far away, that um, probably had cows for 100 years, but she did qualify that they're not the same cows. And you know, there's a lot of dairy farms in the United States that have been there for so long. They are part of the ecosystem. They are part of the economic system. They are the engines that drive their economies. And sometimes it seems like nothing has changed. Like you can still see those hills. You can still see those cows. So as Leo points out, after 100 years, they're different cows. The families may, may, may stay the same, but sometimes the families do change. And sometimes the look of who's farming and who's able to farm changes. So, and, and that's, 
that's the thing is, is for, for an industry that seems so afraid of change, sometimes we don't recognize all the change that happens. Um, the fact that we, you know, wasn't that long ago, really, that we, we decided to, yes, we're going to keep our milk cool so that it's safer and higher quality for people. Um, and then we decided that, yes, we, we are going to make sure that, that we have these standards and regulations that govern our quality of milk because we have such pride of place of of our our product that puts really you know that that sustainable nutrition i mean it's hard to find another package in eight ounces that's going to give you what milk does and and i know that when we look at the two percent um of ghg emissions that that we we contribute to here in the u.s um, to our greenhouse graph, gases, um, it seems like a lot, but it's not, it's, it's 2%. And it seems like we shouldn't be concerned, but we should, even though it's a small number, it's still a number and it's our responsibility. Um, and it seems like we should be able to do something about it. And you know what, we are. And one of the reasons it's so important to do something about it by doing it better is because milk is such a sustainable part of nutrition. It has this value, it has this bioavailability, it has this needed place in our systems and in our bodies. And if we just eliminate it, we not only eliminate that opportunity for sustainable nutrition within our diets, we also eliminate the economic drivers for our for our communities. We also eliminate the stewardship of our of our land. We also eliminate the opportunity for people to be a part of this. And we eliminate a lot of things like manure and the the fact that cows are upcycling and so integral to the food systems outside of dairy, you know, whether you're talking about cottonseed or orange pulp, or you're talking about canola meal, those are all things that cows can take and make amazing milk with and keep it out of our landfills. And I don't see anybody giving up cotton or canola or oranges anytime soon. So as long as people are utilizing those in their world, cows are able to actually utilize them and produce far more than just one little serving of dairy. They're able to provide a lifetime supply of, of good food. They're able to produce manure that goes on to grow more food and can become amazing things, whether we're talking about renewable energy, whether we're talking about material, whether we're talking about packaging, um, biodegradable and, and renewable um, planter pots like cow pots out of uh, Canaan, Connecticut. These are the things that all the things a cow can do. And yes, even at its end of life, it's high quality life, they're going to provide animal protein and all the other uses that comes from that cow that we're going to honor by not simply looking at it and thinking it just drank this amount of water and all it produced was a glass of milk. That's not what it produced. It produced a livelihood. It sustained an economy and a community. It provided opportunity. It provided nutrition and we can do it better. So I have just rambled on for 20 minutes and um, I'm looking to see if there are any more questions. Um, I see um, a couple here, hold on. Um, so Kim, Kim had commented that it's great to have the conversation about the total nutrient package of foods and beverages. So many people don't consider the what's in it for me per bite or sip in terms of health, focusing only on one thing or simply not realizing what else they get for what they choose. And she's so on target with that. And I think that, you know, one of the most telling things for me is it wasn't just that there's, a, there's that one sip of milk or that one ice cream cone. But when we talk about the whole animal and we talk about honoring that whole animal and honoring all the work that has gone into it and all the work that animal has done, I look at like one of the very last stops for, for a cow and I look about the fact that scientists and humans have found a way to make sure that they extract just the tiniest amount of a special substance from their lungs. And that has been found to be one of the most perfect ways science can't match it at this point to make sure that immature lung formation in neonatal care unit patients can be 
be improved and allow these small humans that have come into the world a little bit too early be able to breathe. And I think about that circle of life and I think about that. And if you look on a global, global type view, when we think about who is owning dairy cows and running dairy farms and stewarding these lands and the products they make, we're talking about we're talking about women throughout the globe. While the average dairy herd in in Maine is less than 200 cows and nationwide it's around 187 cows. Um, here's the thing, globally it's 1.2 and it's women women who are doing this work and making that economic investment. It's so important that when we think about how things affect us here, we also remember how it affects others elsewhere. Um, and uh, also, Jamie Jonker did want to ask, um, he wanted to know, um, 3,200 cows sounds like a lot. How can you care for so many cows? I can tell you how we care for them, carefully and intentionally. And we use a lot of standards and best management practices. 98% um, of U.S. milk and cows are coming from farms that are stewarded and guided by the principles of farmers assuring responsible management. Um, it's a voluntary program that actually provides us with guidelines, SOPs, and best management to make sure that we're all on the same track. And it's science-based and data-driven, and it answers questions that both farmers, veterinarians, stakeholders, and consumers have in order to make sure that your good milk comes from a good place. And what is one thing I wish more dietitians knew and understood about dairy farming, about milk? And um, I will say this, I wish more dietitians understood that they can have a conversation with a farmer and learn more. Um, and I wish more dairy farmers understood that they should be having more conversations with dietitians and RDs. I think it is so instrumental that we all connect. We're all reaching out, trying to make sure that we feed people and put good food on the table and give them options. You know, a lot of dairy farmers would, would tell you that they think it's ridiculous to, to get milk from an almond. I'm here to tell you, you know what? If almonds can be processed and you can add water and you can make a product that someone likes and that a farmer can make their living doing it responsibly and a consumer has a choice, I think that's great. But I also think that we need to make sure that we don't set up that one glass of that beverage against a glass of milk as if the two are enemies. Um, you know, just as much as I want all the opportunity for my kids, I want all the opportunities for everyone else to find a way to make their living. And also I want to find, make sure that everybody has an opportunity to put good food in their, on their table. Um, and I'm looking to see if there's any more questions. I am running out of time and I feel like I have rambled on with no direction at all. Blame it on me being completely horrified at being on this side of the camera. Um, but I also want to tell you that um, if you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to just include them in this chat. We'll be checking it. And I will include some of the references I made, including some articles and some information on where to find out more about our family farm, our co-op, as well as some of the standards and practices that are so important to us. And I do want to just make a quick plug for you. Um, coming up in June, it's June Dairy Month. It's a big month, right? We're going to celebrate dairy and our sustainability commitment and the people within dairy and the people who, who make dairy farms possible. And who is that? That's folks who trust us to put food on their table. And it's also Pride Month. And so I am here to tell you that in June, it is Dairy Pride Month, and I want to make sure that everybody understands that it doesn't matter, matter what color cow you have on your dairy farm, you're going to be producing some really good milk. And it doesn't matter who you are or where you are, you should have the opportunity and the right to choose whatever milk you want and from whatever cow you want. I'm gonna go ahead and sign off. I really appreciate everybody joining in. Um, thank you so very much. And to your question, Leah, about uh, learning more about dairy farmers and farming in their area and the resources, I'll be sure to pop that in the chat. Thank you so much, everybody. Have an absolutely fantastic day.